There is plenty of evidence to suggest that Bush wanted this crisis and that the Bush administration policy was to encourage Saddam Hussein and his party to believe that they could take over Kuwait, or either in whole or in part, with impunity. This new world order or new international order that Bush is talking about uh, looks to me like a, an institutionalization or attempt to institutionalize the north-south dimension of the old Cold War, which was a war for natural resources, for labor, and for markets. We used to export, you know, <coughs> simply the hardware, tanks, aircraft, and so forth. But this time, we sent across the hardware and the people to operate it. That turned it into a classic mercenary operation, the sending abroad of military forces to defend a foreign regime. Bush called the Persian Gulf crisis the greatest crisis since World War II. Remember that? The greatest moral crisis since World War II. Well, of course, he was totally wrong. The greatest crisis in World War II is the domestic crisis in the United States in education, in health care. We all know what the domestic crisis is in this country. It is racism, it is drugs, it is violence of every sort. It is the worst educational system in the developed world. It is a system in which one in three people is living in poverty, either totally or in absolute poverty, or so close that they have no relief from want, where one in three people is illiterate, either totally or to the degree that they cannot function or get along in a society based on the written word. Two percent of American families own 54 percent of the net financial assets of this country. Those are the people who really run the United States, of course. And they are the people for whom, that, whom the CIA serves, as does Bush and all those people in the administration, and the professionals who service these very wealthy people. Those, of course, are our version of the Latin American oligarchs. Former CIA officer Phil Agee evaluates the Gulf War and places it in context of American society and the U.S. power structure. Right now on Alternative Views. Philip A. G. was a CIA officer from 1960 to 1969, serving in Ecuador, Uruguay, and Mexico City. He quit the CIA and wrote a very significant book, Inside the Company. Since that time, A. G. has been traveling around the world and writing books and making speeches. This speech, which we'll see on alternative views, was recorded in April of 1991 at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We'll have Phil Agee's speech in a few minutes after a couple of news stories from the alternative press. Well, here we are in the midst of a recession. We're all well aware of that. Layoffs are rising, uh, corporate profits are weak, lots of bankruptcy. But uh, during this time, pay in 1990 for the nation's top executives rose by a bigger percentage than the wages of any other group of American workers. Uh, many chairmen and CEOs received these huge annual salaries under what uh, uh, the corporate system calls uh, pay for, for, for performance. In other words, as corporate profits rise, uh, so do uh, executive profits. <laughs> However, uh, in 1990, neither profits nor stock prices rose at hundreds of companies, but the pay of top echelon uh, executives went way up anyway. 
Now, these increases came uh, when most American workers uh, received raises of uh, less than 5%, which didn't even keep up with inflation. Um, but uh, the average pay for chief executives of large companies uh, runs uh, up to 80, well, up to over 100, but averages 83 times, 83 times the annual wages of the American, uh, average American worker. Uh, the gap, uh, this 83 times gap, has doubled in the last 15 years. It was 41 in 1977, 41 times. Now it's uh, 83 times. Uh, and also the spread between uh, America's executives and uh, those of other industrial nations have increased. Other industrial nations, their top executives run 20 times uh, their average workers. Uh, so our guys are getting uh, an average of four times more relatively than uh, other CEOs uh, uh, in industrialized nations. Uh, in fact, uh, we receive, uh, we, our chief executives receive twice as much as our counterparts in Canada and Germany, and they rank second and third in CEO salaries. Um, a survey by Pete Marwick, uh, one of the big eight accounting firms of big companies, shows that uh, in 1990, executive pay rose by more than 15% over uh, 1989 levels. Um, remember that the average worker got less than 5%. Um, you might wonder how much that is, how much these people are actually taking home. Well, at the 176 uh, big corporations surveyed by uh, uh, Stephen Bryce, who tracks uh, executive pay practices at uh, this accounting firm, Towers Perrin. The median compensation for uh, CEOs at these 106 corporations was uh, $1.7 million in 1990. And uh, for you mathematicians out there, that's $34,000 a month. Not bad. <laughs> According to Dennis Bernstein of the Pacific News Service, the worst is still yet to come for the Iraqi people. While international attention has focused on the desperate plight of Iraq's Kurds, millions of other Iraqis are also at grave risk, especially children, say international relief organizations and medical experts who have toured Iraq in recent weeks. And the Bush administration has no plans to attend to the burgeoning health catastrophe for the Iraqi people. According to Dr. David Levinson, after visiting Iraq with the Pulitzer Prize winning, or rather the Nobel Prize winning, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, the war's real horror lies in the destruction of the health of an entire people through targeting key parts of the infrastructure that supports civilian life. Under Secretary of the United Nations, Marti Atisiari, who's the leader of the UN's mid-March investigation team that toured through Iraq, echoes this sentiment. Nothing that we have seen or read has quite prepared us for the particular form of devastation which has befallen the country. Now most forms of modern life support have been destroyed or rendered tenuous. These life support systems begin with water. Prior to the war, according to Bernstein, the average citizen of Baghdad received 450 liters of water a day that are pumped from the Tigris River through the electrical powered water treatment stations. But the destruction of all significant electrical power generating plants in Iraq has rendered this source of water supply useless and turned water from a source of life into a prime character carrier of death and disease, according to the United Nations. Pumps depend on power, the UN says, which they don't have. And the water and sewage treatment depends on chemicals, which are also blocked by the embargo. As a result, raw sewage is being dumped into the Tigris and sometimes even backing up and overflowing into people's homes. Many Iraqis, reduced to subsisting on 30 to 40 liters of water a day, have turned to drawing polluted water from the Tigris. This combination is a recipe for a public health catastrophe. At the height of the air war, according to Iraq's Minister of Health, Abdul Mohammed, 
the greatest concern was from bad drinking water. He estimated that 3,000 deaths had already occurred from bad drinking water, and probably 2,000 people are under some kind of medical care from drinking contaminated water. Since then, Save the Children reports that typhoid cases have tripled, diarrheal cases have quadrupled, and polio and meningitis have reappeared. Concerns that these diseases could reach epidemic proportions are compounded by the damage sustained by Iraq's health care system. For instance, 14 hospitals and health care facilities were damaged in the bombing, but even a bigger problem is the lack of electrical power. Without power, according to doctors who have visited Iraq, all that we associate with modern health, the storing of blood, the preparation of cultures, preserving medicines and vaccines for children, doing x-rays, all these techniques of modern medicine become impossible. At some hospitals that the Physicians for Social Responsibility visited, doctors were performing surgery under kerosene lamps, often on victims burned in accidents with kerosene utensils. Hospitals also, according to these doctors, lack basic medicine and enough clean water for adequate sanitation. One doctor told the visiting U.S. doctors that he's afraid that instead of being a place where diseases are cured, the hospital is going to be a place where diseases are being spread. Other problems, according to AXFAM, uh, which is an international relief organization, is that healthcare workers can't get out into the fields to visit the small towns of Iraq to prevent the spread of epidemics. And according to the International Red Cross, there's also a wave of, of epidemics that are beginning to spread through the south of Iraq, through Basra that was destroyed by uh, bombing, Allied bombing, and then suffered from the Civil War. And all of the small towns of southern Iraq are already facing cholera and other uh, epidemics. The food si situation is also grim in Iraq. Iraq imports 70% of its food, and the seven months of sanctions compared with, coupled with the war have also s severely squeezed existing supplies. The destruction of key agricultural facilities, including animal vaccine factories, many seed warehouses, have jeopardized future uh, harvests, making widespread starvation a real possibility. Another problem that I read in uh, PeaceNet was that the United States will not allow the Iraqis to use their helicopters to drop pesticides on some of the crops that require pesticides for uh, survival. So whereas Bush allowed the Iraqis to use helicopters to bomb the Kurds and some of the Shiite rebels in the south, they're not allowing the Iraqis to use their helicopters anymore to uh, spray pesticides on their uh, fields. And so thus the Iraqis are uh, facing um, um, starvation. So according to all of the international um, health organizations that have visited Iraq uh, recently. It's a human catastrophe in um, Iraq. According to the uh, UN, it's near apocalyptic uh, conditions. And none of this has been indicated on the mainstream media that just shows American uh, soldiers first doing favors for uh, the refugees in the south of Iraq and more recently um, helping the Kurds out in the um, uh, north of um, Iraq. But according to Tony Cordesman, who, Cordesman, who you heard on ABC as their uh, military uh, commentator, the Iraqi people deserve all of this uh, punishment. He told a uh, Brookings uh, Institute uh, seminar that the Iraqi people should be punished for tolerating their um, uh, government. He said, I think we should use economic concessions to try to force uh, Saddam Hussein out of uh, power. And in the process, we should not become too involved with the uh, harm that is done to the Iraqi uh, people because uh, they deserve anything that uh, uh, happens uh, to them. We'll have more news stories later in the program. But now we're going to turn to our speech by Phil Agee presented by the Speak Out organization from San Francisco. Phil was a CIA officer for nine years, serving in Latin America. Well, we all know, don't we, uh, why 
the United States went into the Gulf. We were responding to naked aggression. We were preserving and defending, quote unquote, our way of life. Uh, jobs were at stake. You remember that one from Baker. And then it was a return to stopping naked aggression uh, and that aggression cannot be rewarded. We all know that we responded from moral principle and from political principle. We also know that Bush went into the Persian Gulf in order to restore to his throne the emir or dictator of Kuwait. And here we have seen just recently his return and the development of Kuwait or the return to Kuwait of that principled democratic system they have there of based on what we all treasure, one man, one vote. <laughs> one vote by the emir. Well, uh, there are alternative explanations, I think, and analyses of why we went into the Persian Gulf. One that we haven't seen really in any uh, meaningful way is the interpretation that a crisis was needed to replace the crisis in Western Europe, the East-West crisis, which largely disappeared with the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. A crisis that would allow for the continuation of the 40-odd-year-old war economy in the United States, wherein more than half the budget, the federal budget, is taken up with military expenditures. You know that uh, the official figure for 1990 was 26% of the national budget going to military expenditures. But that 26% is very convenient for those who want to cover it up because they do not factor into that 20% or 26% many of the most important military costs, such as interest on the national debt from past military expenditures, the retirement benefits for tens of thousands of former Department of Defense employees, civilian employees, and many other uh, items. Analysts who have uh, studied this, the matter have come up with figures going up to 55 to 60 percent. People like Gore Vidal puts it at two-thirds the federal budget going for national defense. Well, that is a system which was certainly at risk, wasn't it, with the collapse of communism in, in Europe. And the only reason that that could have been kept going all through these years has been, of course, the so-called Soviet threat or the permanent crisis atmosphere that developed following 1950 and the Korean War. There is plenty of evidence to suggest that Bush wanted this crisis and that the Bush administration policy was to encourage Saddam Hussein and his party to believe that they could take over Kuwait, or either in whole or in part, with impunity. Consider the following. Iraq already had historical claims over Kuwait. For several centuries, Kuwait had been the southern part of the Basra province of the Ottoman Empire under the Turks. And when, after World War II, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, Kuwait was severed from Basra, the Iraqis did not accept it. The British at that time had moved in, as the French did in other parts of the Middle East, in order to fill the vacuum left with the collapse of the Turkish Empire. The British in 1922 drew the first lines in the sand delineating boundaries for the first time in history between Jordan, Iraq, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. These lines drawn by Sir Percy Cox in 1922, he was the uh, British High Commissioner in Baghdad, these uh, lines were drawn uh, deliberately to deprive Iraq of a viable seaport. The British wanted no competition from Baghdad, which was at that time the uh, cultural and commercial capital of the Gulf region, to their dominance of the Persian Gulf, where they converted no less than 10 sheikdoms into colonies, including Kuwait. When Kuwait was given its independence by the British in 1961, the Iraqis massed troops on the border and threatened to take the territory back by force. But Britain rushed military forces to Kuwait and the Iraqis backed down. The Iraqis threatened to do the very same thing in 1972 and 1976. 
So there were historical Iraqi claims on Kuwait. There were also immediate grievances uh, based partly on uh, Kuwaiti overproduction of petroleum. In 1986, the OPEC countries had set $18 a, uh, per barrel as the bench price for, uh, uh, for the world petroleum market. But the Kuwaitis and the United Arab Emirates for quite a long time since then had been overproducing, forcing the price down as low as about $13 last June. That price was the best price that industrialized countries and importers like the United States were paying for petroleum uh, at constant dollars for more than 40 years. It was hurting the Iraqi economy because the Iraqis had something like 70 to $80 billion in debt from their war, their eight-year war with Iran during the 1980s. And they were demanding that the Iraqis forgive those loans uh, which had helped finance that war. So there are a number of different immediate grievances. Another one was the theft of petroleum from Iraq's Rumaila field, which is this vast oil field dipping into uh, disputed territory between Iraq and Kuwait. In April, the Assistant Secretary of State for Middle Eastern Affairs, a man whose name is John Kelly, testified before the US Congress that the United States had no commitment to defend Kuwait. In July, the OPEC oil ministers met in Geneva, that's mid-July, and Iraq was demanding a raise in the oil price and also the, uh, the elimination of overproduction on the part of uh, Kuwait and the Emirates. Iraq at that time massed 30,000 troops on the Kuwaiti border. Hussein got part of what he wanted. The, uh, the Emirates and Kuwait agreed to stop overproducing. New quotas were sell set in order to maintain a new price of $21 per barrel, even though Iraq had asked for 25. In any case, things uh, were not settled, even with that because Iraq was continuing to demand that Kuwait lease to Iraq two small islands, Bubiyan and Warba, in the, at the head of the Persian Gulf, which would have provided Iraq with a viable seaport. Kuwait refused. Kuwait also refused to uh, forgive the loans that had been made to finance Iraq's war with Iran. Negotiators met in Saudi Arabia between the two countries on the 1st of August. Kuwait did not uh, compromise, and the next day, Saddam Hussein invaded. Well, the United States was not unaware that this was coming by any means. On April 25th, some of you have read this, I'm sure. On April, I mean, on uh, July 25th, April Glasby, the US ambassador to Iraq, had a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting with Saddam Hussein. At that meeting, she said, according to a transcript, apparently the Iraqis recorded the conversation secretly and later made available the transcript, a transcript which, by the way, has not been disputed by the Department of State. At this meeting, the U.S. ambassador said to uh, Saddam Hussein, I have a direct instruction from the Secretary of State to emphasize to you that the United States has, quote unquote, no opinion on your border disputes uh, with Kuwait. She also said, I have an instruction from the President to seek better relations with Iraq. At this time, there were 100,000 Iraqi troops poised on the border because after the OPEC conference in Geneva uh, in, Geneva in uh, mid-July, the Iraqis did not withdraw those 30,000 troops. They more than tripled them to something like 100,000. During this time also, in the days following, uh, or the week following, uh, the ambassador's meeting with Hussein up to the invasion, the CIA, according to press reports and according to Senator Boren, who is the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, the CIA was predicting that Iraq would invade Kuwait. And in fact, in the meeting between the US ambassador and Hussein, Hussein himself responded to her saying, in effect, that he was going to take drastic action against Kuwait if they did not agree to his demands. So it was as clear as crystal, I believe, that Hussein was going to invade Kuwait. But during the, that week, that crucial week between the ambassador's meeting with Hussein and the invasion, with those 100,000 Iraqi troops on the border, the Bush administration did absolutely nothing. And there were things they could have done. They could have called, for example, a, an emergency meeting of the uh, United Nations Security Council. They could have sent a multinational military force to Kuwait to defend that country, just as the British had done earlier. They could have issued public warnings, 
but they did something to the contrary. They prohibited the United States Information Agency from making a warning to Hussein on a program that had been scheduled. The Assistant Secretary of State, John Kelly, himself uh, killed that program and forbid any U.S. government warnings to Hussein or to the thousands of people who might become hostages in the event of an invasion of Kuwait. Then, two days before the invasion, the same Assistant Secretary of State, John Kelly, goes before the Congress one more time. And again, he says, the United States has no commitment to defend Kuwait. Well, put all those things together, and it cer certainly seems to add up to a situation in which the United States was enticing or encouraging Hussein to take over Kuwait in order to create a new international crisis in a key position of the world. Certainly, if Hussein took over Kuwait, he would control then 20% of the known petroleum reserves in the world, a concentration in radical nationalist Arab hands uh, that would be too great to be accepted by any Western industrialized country and even by Iraq's principal arms supplier, the Soviet Union. Well, when Bush came out with the remark very early on that, quote, our way of life is at stake, he reminded me quite clearly of something that President Truman had said back in 1950. You know, the decision was taken in 1950 to establish a permanent war economy, that is to make military expenditures the motor of the U.S. economy. It was because there was tremendous fear that we were heading back to the conditions of the Depression of the 1930s. During those first five years after the end of World War II, up to 1950, the United States economy had contracted, or the GNP had declined by 20 percent. And unemployment, which had been almost nothing in 1945, 700,000, had gone up to 4.7 million. The highest echelons of the Truman administration considered the problem and decided that the way to avoid a return to the uh, condition of the 1930s was military expenditures, rearmament in the United States and in Western Europe. The entire plan was drawn up in a document called NSC 68, NSC standing for National Security Council. It, it was written by Paul Nitze, who was then the uh, chief of the pol policy planning staff of the Department of State. This is about a 40-page document. It was top secret for 25 years and released only by accident in 1975 and published. My version of it, which comes from the uh, Naval War College magazine, runs to about 48 or 50 pages. It's a world analysis and the U.S. role in the world. Uh, the, the key quote from that document was this. The United States and other free nations will, within a period of a few years at most, experience a decline in economic activity of serious proportions unless more positive governmental programs are developed. Well, the solution adopted, the more positive governmental programs, was the rearming not only of the United States, but also of Western Europe. The problem we faced at that time, uh, from an economic point of view, was that United States exports were not sufficient to sustain the economy. And the subsidy program known as the Marshall Plan, having failed, there had to be other ways to get enough dollars over to Western Europe to foment European imports from the United States that would sustain the U.S. economy. And remilitarization of Western Europe with Germany, West Germany, as the key pivotal country was adopted. The money was transferred then in billions of dollars through so-called defense support grants. And the economic sit uh, situation in the United States uh, was saved, at least through that method. And we have been with this permanent war economy ever since. Of course, it took a crisis, it took a threat, and the Department of State and other agencies set about to create that permanent crisis atmosphere, to create the Soviet Union as a threat to our way of life. But because there was so much money involved, Truman could not get the money from Congress uh, right away. It took the Korean War, a real crisis, to uh, enable him to uh, defeat congressional opposition and get the money. The war, you know, started in June 1950, and by uh, September 
the Allied troops with you, which the United States had formed under a, an alliance and under the UN banner, very similar to the Gulf crisis, uh, had forced the North Koreans back up to the 38th parallel, the boundary. And that is what the UN sanctions called for, for expelling North Korea from South Korea. That would have ended the war right then and there, three months after it started, if Truman had accepted a Soviet proposal in the United Nations. But he had to keep this crisis going because he needed to use the Korean War to overcome congressional opposition to this rearmament program. He had another plan. He, in, he violated the UN, the UN Charter or the UN uh, resolutions, in fact, by invading North Korea, uh, threatening to overthrow the communist government of North Korea and reunite the country under the dictatorship that the United States had imposed in the South. Well, the Chinese said they were going to come into the war if that advance uh, toward the Yalu River, the boundary between North Korea and China, was not stopped. Truman did not stop the forces the Chinese entered, and by November, U.S. forces were again retreating south. By December, the newspapers here, the, all the media were full of stories and pictures of retreating U.S. troops before hordes of advancing Chinese communist troops. It was then, early December, that Truman went on national radio. He declared a state of national emergency and he said what Bush's re uh, uh, remarks about our way of life being at stake reminded me of. Truman mustered all the hype and emotion that he could, and he said, our homes, our nation, all the things that we believe in are in great danger. This danger has been created by the rulers of the Soviet Union. Well, he also called at that time for uh, massive increases in U.S. rearmament expenditures and for the re rearmament of Western Europe. He got the money then, but of course the Soviet was not a threat at all. They were still rebuilding from the rubble of World War II where they had lost something like 20 million people. Uh, they were not a threat, but this was part of the whole scenario to create the international crisis, the international threat, in order to justify the militarism which Truman was beginning. And uh, he got the money he wanted. The, in two years, from 1950 to 1952, the U.S. military budget more than tripled from 13 billion in 1950 to 44 billion in 1952. And U.S. military forces doubled to 3.6 million people. From that time on, uh, we have lived in the United States with this uh, military economy. And that is the thing that Bush, I think, in the Gulf wanted to save. He had to have another crisis, as I've said uh, twice already, he had to have another crisis to replace the one that disappeared in Western Europe. Well, in the Cold War, uh, you know, there was a, there were several dimensions. A lot of people, you will hear, say the Cold War is over. Well, I say to those who think the Cold War is over that they should think uh, once more. The East-West dimension in Western Europe between the United States and NATO and the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, that east-west dimension in Europe has indeed largely disappeared. But there was always a north-south dimension of the Cold War, and that is the war against the so-called Third World. That is, in fact, where the fighting really took place, as in Vietnam. This new world order or new international order that Bush is talking about uh, looks to me like a, an institutionalization or attempt to institutionalize the north-south dimension of the old Cold War, which was a war for natural resources, for labor, and for markets. And our dependence, this, uh, that is the Western dependence, and especially the United States economic dependence on the natural resources of third world countries is certainly not going to disappear. We need still to attempt to control those resources. And this Gulf intervention, of course, is not at all about stopping naked aggression. We have produced naked aggression. We have con connived in naked aggression. We have encouraged naked aggression in many different ways. And that naked aggression that we have encouraged has often been very well rewarded. Take Turkey's occupation since the 1970s of one-third of Cyprus. They have received something like $9 billion in U.S. aid. The Israelis are now at this very moment, occupying the, the territories. They're occupying part, occupying part of Syria and part of Lebanon.
There are many different examples. Indonesia's takeover of East Timor in the 1970s. The United States even encouraged that, and uh, an enormous, it may have been 10 or 15 percent of the population of East Timor was killed in the Indonesian suppression of their independence. They had been a Portuguese colony up until the Indonesians tried to annex them. Many of us have seen the uh, discussion going on uh, about who should pay for this. How much the Germans should pay, how much the Japanese should pay, how much should be paid to countries whose economies were affected by the uh, war. Turkey, Jordan, Egypt, for example. This always seemed like such a false argument to me. The Kuwaitis have more than $100 billion invested outside their country through KIO, KIO, the Kuwait Investment Office based in London, with uh, branches in New York and Madrid and Paris and all over. They have more than $1 billion, $100 billion invested abroad, and they have enormous petroleum reserves. I think they can keep on pumping for probably another 100 years, and they won't run out. They will certainly have enough to pay from past earnings and from future earnings. The Saudis, the same. We went there first to defend the Saudi regime and the Saudi uh, natural resources, petroleum. They, too, are making enough money from it to pay all the costs. There is no reason why one American should pay one cent for that operation. Those countries should pay, and that would conform with reality, wherein United States military forces have been exported abroad like one more export. We used to export, you know, <coughs> simply the hardware, tanks, aircraft, and so forth. But this time, we sent across the hardware and the people to operate it. That turned it into a classic mercenary operation, the sending abroad of military forces to defend a foreign regime. And I don't say mercenary in a totally derogatory sense, because George Washington may not have won the war for independence against uh, Britain if it hadn't been for the Hessian mercenaries who came over and fought at his side. Well, the CIA, of course, was a very important tool in the Cold War. And certainly it was important in building up Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Uh, I suppose most of you have read already that the United States, uh, in its support for Iraq all during that war with Iran, was giving Iraq the best intelligence possible on I Iranian troop movements. It was. Uh, what I've read is that they were giving them uh, real-time satellite information so that they could uh, confront and defeat the Iranian forces uh, in that war. I even read uh, one very good uh, report from the Washington Post uh, that the CIA office in Baghdad became much more important than the ambassador's own office because that is the office where the Iraqis wanted to deal most. But the question arises when we talk about these foreign interventions, whether they are the secret interventions for the support of death squads and torture, or whether it is an, the sending of 500,000 troops to smash a third world country that got out of line. We still have to ask the question, why do we do these things? In whose interest are these activities? When I was a trainee in the CIA, I was taught that the Soviet Union's foreign policy, its expansionism, its belligerence, was a direct product of the domestic system in the Soviet Union. The requirements of the Soviet Communist Party to retain a monopoly on power. I think any political scientist would agree that a society's or a nation's domestic policy is a direct product of its domestic system. So if we want to answer the question of why we do these grisly things abroad, like like hosing all those retreating Iraqi soldiers who had no way of defending themselves, killing between 100,000 and 200,000 people. When, when we want to ask, answer the question of why we do these things abroad, we have to come back, I think, and look at the domestic system in this country. And this system, of course, is a system in great crisis. Bush called the Persian Gulf crisis the greatest crisis since World War II. Remember that? The greatest moral crisis since World War II. Well, of course, he was totally wrong. The greatest crisis in World War II is the domestic crisis in the United States, in education, in health care. We all know what the domestic crisis is in this country. It is racism. It is drugs. It is violence of every sort. It, 
is the worst educational system in the developed world. It is a system in which one in three people is living in poverty, either totally or in absolute poverty, or so close that they have no relief from want, where one in three people is illiterate, either totally or to the degree that they cannot function or get along in a society based on the written word. And we have a system in which one in three Americans does not even register to vote. And of those who do register, 20% of them don't vote, meaning that only about 50% of the potential voters vote in national elections in this country. Therein, we elect a president with about 24 or 25% of the potential vote. We don't have popular participation even in the political process. Well, this is, I hate to say, the way it's supposed to be. When I came back to the United States in 1987, for the first time in 17 years, you remember what we were doing, don't you? We were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. I watched all that orgy of self-congratulation that year, and it reminded me of a passage in one of Noam Chomsky's uh, books, Turning the Tide on Central America. In that book, he discussed the Constitutional Convention of 1787 in Philadelphia, where 55 men got together in total secrecy. Not one word was revealed until more than 50 years after the convention, one word of what was said there, to find solutions to problems in governing the United States under the Articles of Confederation. The question arose, as, Ch as Chomsky wrote, who really is to govern the United States? And John Jay had the answer. You remember John Jay was the president of the Continental Congress that fought the war for independence. And he was also the first Chief Justice of the United States, of the Supreme Court. John Jay had the answer. He said, well, of course, the people who own the United States ought to govern it. And so they wrote the Constitution at his suggestion. They wrote out of the political process something like 95% of the inhabitants of the United States. Democracy was the last thing they had in mind in writing the Constitution. There is a book up here called Toward an American Revolution. It's by Jerry Frazier, a PhD from UMass at Amherst which I tell people would be the best $10 they could spend on a book during their four, five, or six years in university, because that is the story of how the Constitution was adopted and who the people were who wrote it. They were the elite of colonial society, the lawyers, the merchants, the uh, bankers, the slaveholders, the landowners, and so forth, the wealthy people, and they wrote it to protect their wealth. They wrote it to enshrine what is still the first human right in the United States. All others are secondary. The first human right here is to accumulate wealth and the power that goes with it. All others, like the right to life, the right to uh, education, the right to housing, the right to a job, the right to proper health care, all those are secondary. The Constitution enshrined that one right before any other. Well, I highly recommend Frazier's book. That Constitution really is the root of the problem uh, uh, of, the, of the domestic crisis that we have today, in my opinion. There have been some 25 amendments, amendments and a lot of legislation over these 200 years. But the rules of the game as laid down in the Constitution are the same as they were at the beginning. It was the original pact between the political forces to keep the political debate in the United States as narrow as possible and to make those rules of the game as hard to change as possible. It's the root of the situation in when we go out and vote today and we're selecting between Republicans and Democrats, we're really only choosing between, on the one hand, Tweedledum, and on the other, <laughs> Tweedledee. And there, <laughs> there are, there are, of course, many people who would like to see a, I sometimes say third and make a mistake, a second party in the United States. <laughs> and that would be possible, but this, Domestic crisis, crisis makes it very difficult. If we solve the education problem and we had informed voters and participants in the political process, if we solve health problems, for example, if people had a, uh, an attraction to the political process, then there would be a real threat of democracy in this country. And that is what is behind, in my opinion, 
the war economy in the first place, the continuation of the war economy, and the need for this crisis in the Gulf. Yes. Uh, you used the word oligarchy about South and Central America. So you use, can you talk about oligarchy here in the United States? Well, uh, I did mention this book by Jerry Frazier, Toward American Revolution, and those, of course, were the original oligarchs, weren't they, of this country. Uh, have, the system has continued, of course. We have, you know, I used to think that Latin America was uh, terrible in terms of the dis distribution of wealth and income. But then I learned from the Catholic bishop's uh, report on the economy of 1987, I think it is, that 2% of American families own 54% of the net financial assets of this country. 2% of American families own 54% of the net financial assets of this country. Those are the people who really run the United States, of course. And they are the people for whom, that whom the CIA serves, as does Bush and all those people in the administration, and the professionals who service these very wealthy people. Those, of course, are our version of the Latin American oligarchs. We should also continue in international solidarity, as before. The FMLN in El Salvador and the FDR, they need our sol solidarity as much as they ever did. The same goes... The same goes for the FSLN in Nicaragua. And the same goes for Cuba, which is very likely to be seen as incompatible with Bush's new international order. I've just spent a week in Cuba. I came back from there two weeks ago, and I had probably the most interesting trip I've had there in the 20 years that I've been coming and going and working in solidarity with the revolution. They are in extreme crisis, and they need our help. Uh, and hope also that we can break the information blockade on what is really happening in Cuba so that ordinary Americans who have a sense of decency will see that this policy against Cuba for the last how many years? 30 at least, 1960, yeah, 30 years uh, is erroneous and that we op ought to open up trade and uh, commerce with Cuba. One more uh, thing that we can do, certainly on the campuses and certainly on a campus like this where there has been such a long and important CIA presence, is activism against the CIA on the campuses. There certainly is no just... <laughs> There certainly is no justification in allowing, for example, murder incorporated to come on the campuses of the United States to recruit young Americans to go into that work. <laughs> Finally, I might just mention this. Last Thursday, uh, I participated in a press conference with Ramsey Clark in New York at the UN in which he announced a war crimes tribunal which will be international in scope, and will seek to raise all the evidence and information on war crimes committed by the United States and its allies against Iraq. This includes all of those items which specifically fall under the Geneva Conventions of 1949, including targeting civilian areas, targeting the life support, civilian, uh, life support system of civilians, such as water supply, such as electricity, such as uh, sewage systems, killing retreating soldiers who have no way to defend themselves. Those kinds of things are all very specifically uh, spelled out. And this is uh, just starting up now. Last Thursday, the first delegation went to uh, Amman, five people, to start collecting information from refugees there. And it so happened that just a few days ago, I was speaking with a friend who knows a family very well, whose son had written home from the Gulf saying that he had seen with his own eyes U.S. soldiers executing Iraqi prisoners. He wants to make that public. And I urge all of you who know people who are in the military who are over there or who have relatives who somehow can get the word out, if anyone wants to talk about what happened, they have a place to go. And this is to this tribunal. Well, finally, I would say that we should and must spread the word about Bush's lies and his hypocrisy on the Gulf intervention and his bombing of Iraq
back to the pre-industrial age for no reason but for his own re-election. You know that last September and October when we were having the elections, Bush was saying the sanctions are working, but he realized that for his own re-election, they might take more than two years to work. And come 1992 and the electoral campaign, he might be seen very much as Jimmy Carter was seen in 1980, as hostage to a foreign crisis, as weak, as indecisive, and he made the decision right then and there, I'm sure, to trade all these lives for his own re-election. Because the sanctions would have worked. No country has ever been blockaded by the whole world. It was like an, a medieval city siege, and they would have worked, but they wouldn't perhaps have worked soon enough uh, for Bush's re-election. We must reject his boast when 1992 comes <clears throat> that he made the world safe from Saddam Hussein. And we must eject, eject him from the White House in order to make the world safe from George Bush. I thank you all very much. This speech of Phil Agee's was videotaped at MIT on the 4th of April, 1991, produced by Speak Out. And here are some of the names of the people and organizations that made the production possible. If you're interested in having Phil Agee speak to your organization, here is the address of a speak out in San Francisco. Their phone number is 415-864-4561. You also might be interested in seeing a list of publications concerning the CIA and the Gulf War. There's the Covert Action Information Bulletin, Lies of Our Times, the CIA Off-Campus Handbook, Unclassified, Middle East Report, Palestine Focus. Now these are ones which are dealing more specifically with the Gulf War. Now let's return to a couple of special reports and news stories from the alternative press. I saw an interesting um, estimate of how many civilians there were in the Iraqi um, war. And that was an estimation by a, a German uh, military man who pointed out that there was 120 uh, 1,000 U.S. sorties, Allied sorties, uh, flown over Iraq during the 40-some uh, days of the uh, war. And he said he uh, calculates that uh, 150,000 to 200,000 civilians were killed in the U.S. Uh, bombing. And among the military, he estimates that uh, 160,000 were uh, killed. So this comes to about half a million um, victims of the um, Iraqi war. And the question that this German uh, military man um, raised, was it worth it? to, uh, quote, unquote, liberate uh, Kuwait, to kill um, half a million Iraqis, and to totally destroy their uh, economic and uh, human uh, infrastructure of the um, country with the most intense bombing raids since uh, World War uh, II. Three years ago, prompted by terrifying stories of death and suffering caused by inaccurate medical tests from unregulated laboratories, Congress passed a law establishing strict standards for uh, medical uh, laboratory testing throughout the nation. But the law has never been carried out. The Bush administration has missed virtually every deadline for action, and federal health officials say that the standards aren't likely to be enforced before next year, if then. The problem of delay actually goes back even further to a 1986 law uh, by Congress, which directed uh, DHHS to report to, uh, to them on minimum standards that might be used to regulate laboratories and doctors' offices. The report was due in April 1987. So far, Congress hasn't seen it. This new law, the one that was passed in 88, says that uh, on April 1st, 1990, and annually thereafter, the government has to publish data about the performance of laboratories <coughs> 
that have been penalized under Medicare or Medicaid or convicted under federal or state laws relating to fraud and abuse, false billings, or kickbacks. The administration has yet to make that information available. Uh, by January 1990, the government was supposed to uh, establish procedures for imposing civil and criminal penalties and fines and so forth on laboratories that violated standards. Uh, they have yet to adopt such procedures and they're still working on some kind of proposal. And uh, again, the law directed the Public Health Service to study five topics, including problems in the diagnosis and treatment of patients caused by inaccurate laboratory test results. Uh, the reports were supposed to be sent by May 1st, 1990, but uh, so far uh, no work has been done and federal officials say that the studies will not be completed until uh, 1993 or 1994 even. I've got a few more examples of uh, the kind of thing that's happened. Um, this is pretty good. Twenty years after Congress ordered the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to identify and regulate hazardous air pollutants, the agency has issued emission standards for seven chemicals. Uh, in 1987, Congress established a comprehensive program of assistance to homeless people. But recently, federal district judge Oliver Gash accused the administration of a complete failure to comply with the law, saying pitifully few unused federal properties have been made available to assist the homeless. And uh, the government has yet to issue final regulations for cleaning up waste storage sites under a 1984 law. Uh, as a result, thousands of companies are uh, acting under a cloud of doubt and uncertainty. They may be shut down at any minute when, uh, when and if this, these regulations are, uh, are ever uh, put forth. Um, and in most cases, federal officials blame the, these problems on uh, the complexities of the laws that Congress didn't understand what they were asking and uh, there's not enough money to set these things up. But it's uh, more likely part of uh, a sort of a broader attitude by our highest uh, government officials of contempt uh, for the laws that are supposed to regulate this nation. And that brings us to the end of another Alternative Views. We'd like to thank Eric Eubank, who is our crew for our news section, and the organization Speak Out for providing us with the tape of the speech. Bye.